fear though the people couldn't see what messiah ought to be through your word contain the plan they just could not understand your most awesome work was done in the frailty of your son el shaddai el shaddai el aliona adonai age to age you're still the same by the power of the name el shaddai el shaddai er kamkana adonai we will praise and lift you high el shaddai el shaddai el shaddai el aliona adonai age to age you're still the same by the power of your name el shaddai el shaddai er kamkana adonai we will praise and lift you high el shaddai Thank you, Cheryl. Would the children please come forward for the children's message? We've got more room up here. Good girl. Here she comes. Thanks for coming. Have a seat. Well, good morning, girls. It's just the girls up here today, just the girls group. We have been talking so much this month about worship. We've talked about how praying is part of worship. We've talked about how learning Bible verses and reading the Bible is part of worship. Very good. Singing is part of worship. Praying? You got it. And praying is part of worship. Let's give them a hand. Good job. Now, when we do all those things, should we do them when times are going really good? When there's good, happy things happening? Absolutely. What about when we're having a bad day? You're absolutely right. We should do all of those parts of worship, whether we're having a good day or a bad day. And I did not know this morning that Miss Cheryl was going to sing. Didn't she do a beautiful job? And Miss Cheryl, we've been praying for her because she's going through a hard time. She's getting some special medicine to make her well and keep her healthy. And is it fun to get medicine? Only when it's fun flavored. Well, Miss Cheryl's medicine is definitely not fun flavored. But even in a time when it's not necessarily a fun time for Miss Cheryl, she got up there and she sang to us. She worshiped with us, speaking the many names of God. And that's what we call a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes it's easy to sing when things are happy and when things are going good. But you're right, God wants us to worship and pray and read the Bible and be a preacher, teacher to those around us, no matter what is happening in our lives. Now, before we pray, there's someone who has a verse that they learned to share with us. Would you like to share it, Amelia? Another one. Another one. All right. Psalm 16, 8, he is always with me. Right, another great verse. Let's give her a hand. 
And we had Miss Ella this morning shared a wonderful verse with me, so let's give her a hand too. Good job, Ella. It's so important that you are memorizing Bible verses because when we have those hard times, we can sing, we can pray, we can preach, and we can also fall back on those verses to remind us that God loves us. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for all we've learned this month about worship. We pray as the months go on, we continue to learn words of your Bible. We pray that you would remind us to pray and to sing, to worship, and to be preacher teachers to the words, uh, to the people around us, that we would share words that show them that you love them. We pray that you would be with us this week. Help us to be witnesses for you and to share God's love. In thy name, amen. You may be seated. Morning, church. Morning. We're going to take some time to pray this morning. Do you have any joys or concerns that you would like to share with the rest of us before we pray? Let me add two things. First of all, uh, if you could be praying for the Robertson family, um, this is Skip's Uncle Ed, who passed away last evening. So please be praying for uh, the Schaefers as well, uh, but the Robertson family. Also, uh, as Heather mentioned, Cheryl gets uh, not good tasting medicine, or she didn't taste it at all, really, but um, this Wednesday we go in for um, an injection. So please be praying for that. Last week we were there for about two and a half hours, and they hadn't ordered the right stuff, so it was a wasted trip. So this week we need to make sure everything goes well, uh, so we please be praying not only that things go well, but we really, uh, our, our prayer is that this immunotherapy drug that she is having is going to just do wonders, so please be praying for that. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, your word tells us that uh, when we keep your words in our hearts, it helps us to not sin against you. And how important it is to know your word. And then when we know your word, <clears throat> to be obedient and follow it. So we come together on Sunday morning to hear your word in various ways through music, through times of prayer, through the spoken word, even in times of fellowship. Because when two or more are gathered in your name, then you are there with us, whether we're in this building or many miles away. We pray that you'd bless each one of us, that you would encourage each one of us to learn and to grow that we would always be remembering that you are with us. That you don't leave us when times get tough. And you don't leave us when, <clears throat> when things are going really well. But that you are always with us. I pray that you would encourage us. That you would bring folks around each one of us to encourage us. That we might get phone calls or emails or texts or a visit that you would be very present in the fellowship that, that each one of us can have. Because when we are with others, <clears throat> we know that you are there with us as well. We ask that you'd open our hearts and our minds and our ears this morning that we would continue to hear you and see you and experience you. And that we might grow more like Jesus each day. This we ask in his name. And join in his prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, <clears throat> hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Rise the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn is number 128, He Leadeth Me. Let's stand and let's sing together. may be seated. If you have your Bible and you'd like to open, we're going to be looking at the last, last half of the book of Genesis, beginning with chapter 24. You ever notice that uh, some of the comments that people make about the Bible, um, they say things like, The Bible is full of pious, well-meaning people who have no clue about things in the real world. Let me give you a quick review of just some things. Cain is jealous of his brother Abel, so he kills him. Noah, the most righteous man of his generation, gets drunk and curses his grandson. Lot, when his home is surrounded by residents of Sodom who want to violate his visitors, offers his daughters instead. Abraham plays favorites between his sons. They end up estranged for years. Isaac plays favorites with his sons and they become bitter enemies. Marriages are filled with disasters. Abram has sex with his wife's servant at his wife's request, and then sends this woman and her son off into the desert. Isaac and Rebekah fight over which of the boys get the blessing. 
Jacob's first son, Reuben, sleeps with his father's concubine. By the way, this is all in the book of Genesis. These are not the Waltons. They need Dr. Phil, Dr. Spock, Dr. Seuss. They need somebody. Now, do you feel a little bit about your family now? You feel better? Why is all this stuff in the Bible? I mean, these are horrible stories. Uh, Dinah, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 34, is raped by a man named Shechem, and Jacob doesn't do anything about it. His sons Levi and Simeon respond by suckering the men of Shechem's city to get circumcised so they can't run around and then they murder them all. It's disgraceful behavior. And there's no confusion on the part of Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible uh, but the real hero is God who works with people who are not perfect, who live in a fallen world, and still God is with them. And God can be with us as well. This is the heart of the Old Testament. How God was with Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and how he can be with us. So, let's begin. God is with Isaac. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 24, here's how it begins. Abraham was very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way, and he said to his senior servant of his household, who's by the name, his name was Eleazar, the one in charge of all that he had, said, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. Now that was the method, by the way, of making a promise in the ancient times. You put your hand under the thigh. He said, but we'll go to my country and my relatives and get a wife for my son, Isaac. The concern is that is that Isaac will, be, will, will not be tempted into idolatry, into leaving this, this God of his by a pagan Canaanite woman. And this theme runs all the way through the Bible, that is be, not being unequally yoked. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked. So this servant, Eliezer, goes to a part of the world that he does not know, there's no maps. And so here's what he does first. He prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. He prays. This is, by the way, the second prayer in the Bible. And he's not even a Hebrew. But he trusts God. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. He's on his knees and his prayer is answered. And she's beautiful. And, and in response to his prayer, she says, I will draw water for your camels so they can have as much as they want. Now here's a question. Let me read that, what she says again. She says, I'll draw water for your camels so they can have as much as they want. Here's a question for you. Do you know how much a camel can drink? Any idea? Up to 300 gallons of water. This girl has some serious biceps. And Eliezer recognizes God at work. And finally, Eliezer accomplishes his mission. And the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the God, the God of my praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. He ends with worship. This is God at work. Let me share with you two words that 
that describe God. The word transcendent, which means he is eternally self-sufficient apart from his creation. And the word eminent. This is the idea that God is continually actively present with us. Transcendent means he is eternally self-sufficient apart from his creation. And imminent means that he is, he, he is continually actively present with us. What we read here is, is this transcendent God who existed before time is also the imminent God who's right there with us right now. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So God is watching over Isaac and he gives this great promise. He says, stay in this land for a while and I'll be with you. I'll be with you, catch that, and will bless you for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. Secondly, God is with Jacob. Now, Isaac has two sons. Keep that in mind. And when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body is like a hairy garment. And so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Right out of the womb, there's a problem. Esau has a serious hair problem, and Jacob is a con artist. These are two different people. Isaac dotes on Esau because he's a man's man. He's not the brightest bulb in the pack, but he's a man's man. And Rebecca favors Jacob, so she helps him deceive his dad, her husband. And then God decides to send Jacob to character school because life is going to get really very hard for Jacob. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob has left home and he's fleeing from Esau who wants to kill him. And he has a vision where he sees a staircase with angels coming up and down. And this is a picture of the connectedness between heaven and those who dwell on earth. It's recorded in, in chapter 28, these words. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I'll bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have promised what I've promised you. I've done what I promised you. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he'd placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Notice this. He sets up a pillar so he won't forget. He calls the place Bethel. Now Beth, if you break that word down in Hebrew, the word Beth means house. El means Elohim, God. This is the house of God. So where is God present? Everywhere. Right here. He's right there. This is the beginning of Jacob's transformation. In chapter 29, he goes to to Haran, which is the hometown of his grandfather Abraham. If you remember, we talked about Abraham last week. And he, and he finds a guy by the name, well, he's, he's Uncle Laban. And in Laban, he meets his match. Laban is the king of Conars. And Jacob meets some folks as well as Laban's daughter. So beginning with verse 9 of chapter 29, here's what it says. And so while he's still talking with them, Rachel came out with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. 
And when Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Now, a little bit of background. The stones that covered the wells were huge. Remember, Jacob was an indoor boy. He was mama's boy. He doesn't have body by Jake, okay? He has body by Jacob. He's not very impressive, but he is so inspired by Rachel that he wants to show off. And it's, it's, it's kind of like he's on steroids of love and he rolls the stone away. Usually it took a couple of shepherds to lift the stone and roll it away. Jacob does it all by himself. And then this, Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. That's kind of unusual, wouldn't you think? Any woman here have your husband kiss you then start to cry? There's so much we could say about that. <laughs> Many of you know this story that Laban has two daughters. Leah's the older one and Jacob, however, loves Rachel. And so he works seven years to get her. And on the wedding night, into his tent wrapped in a veil, silent in the darkness, Laban sends daughter number one, Leah. Look at chapter 29, verse 25. Jacob says to Laban, What's this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Now note the word deceived. This is a form of his own name, Jacob. And this is the theme of the story. Jacob has to learn what it is like to be on the receiving end of what he's been dishing out all along. Think of, <laughs> think of what that wedding night must have been like for Leah. The story of heartache of the unloved sisters is really one of the saddest in Scripture. But we read that God hears and God cares and God notices her tears. God is with Leah. So Jacob works seven more years for Rachel, a total of 14 years. He goes to character school and he begins to change. God is with him. And he decides to return home and face his brother Esau, who earlier, many years ago, had wanted to kill him. This is a dangerous decision. And Jacob has an encounter with God on the way. And he wrestles with this mysterious man until daybreak and then he says I will not let you go unless you bless me and he discovers that he's been wrestling with God and God gives him a new name his name is now Israel which means he who struggles with God and so he goes to meet his brother Esau and he goes first he goes as a new man. Was Esau filled with anger? Was Esau filled with vengeance? Look at Genesis chapter 33, verse 4. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. Must be a family thing. One of the greatest statements in the Bible is next. Jacob says to Esau, If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. To see the face means to know someone. In other words, you remind me of God. God is with Jacob. God is also with Joseph. We move to the next generation, but a, a quick note about Genesis chapter 36, verse 1. It reads like this. This is the account of the family line of Esau, that is, Edom. Now, if you've been reading Genesis, and hopefully you have, 
you've noticed this phrase, this is the account of, or this is the family of. Genesis is organized this way into 10 sections, 50 chapters to us, but this section is interesting because it is about the Edomites. Now, to the original readers, the, the Edomites were their bitter enemies. More words of judgment on the Edomites are found in Scripture than any other place or any other, any other tribe. So an Israelite would, would read this and say, I don't want to read this. Why are they here? This is our book. The Edomites matter to God. And this is God's way of saying so. So, on to chapter 37. Jacob is the son, of, I'm sorry, Joseph is the son of Jacob's old age. He's the firstborn of Rachel. And Joseph was the favorite. And so, Jacob gave Joseph a robe now, some versions say it was a coat of many colors. Others say it was a, a robe of long sleeves. That doesn't matter. Think of it like this. Joseph gets a coat from Oscar de la Renta, and his brothers got theirs from Walmart on the clearance rack. And there's a ceremony involved when such robes are given in, ancient, in the ancient East that mark the recipient of receiving that as the father's primary heir. Joseph was the 11th son in the family line. He was not the firstborn. That's usually where the, the inheritance went. But because he got this robe, this coat, he's saying to the rest of the family, this is the primary heir. So Joseph gets the farm. And he is not liked. And plus, he didn't help his cause at all. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a son of, the young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, a son of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. This is what we call a snitch. This is what we call a tattletale. But this is actually worse because the word for report or a tale, depending on the version that you're reading, it's found in other places of scripture, is it's used as an untrue story. Which means Joseph quite possibly and probably made up bad stuff about his brothers and his father believed him. And then Joseph had some dreams. One of them said that his brothers would eventually bow down to him and that he would be ruling over them. Think they were happy about that? It's recorded in chapter 37. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And then Joseph has another dream. And you would think he would keep these to himself. But this one includes his parents. And so they are going to bow down to him as well. And so he's sold into slavery. But notice these words from chapter 37, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. And for a while, things go well until Mrs. Potiphar makes advances and Joseph ends up in prison. But notice this again. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Eventually, God raises Joseph up and uses him to save the whole population of, Israel, of Egypt from starving during a famine. And one day, years later, he is reconciled with his brothers. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, is a summary of Joseph's entire life. It's really a statement about the theology of Genesis. When Joseph's brothers find out who he is, they throw themselves before him and tell him, 
will be your slaves. And they believe that he's going to be furious at them because of what they had done years before. But instead he says, don't be afraid. I'm not angry. And then he said this. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And it all begins to come true. God's dream of community. Remember the promise to Abraham? All the peoples on the earth will be blessed by you. And the people are alive and they're blessed because of Abraham's offspring. So in Genesis, where, where is God present? Everywhere. He's with Adam in the garden. He's with Noah in the flood. He's with Ishmael in the desert. He's with Eliezer on an impossible task of finding a wife. He's with a lonely slave boy in prison. In the most unlikely places, he is Emmanuel, God with us. And listen, you never, you never know where he'll pop up next. So your assignment this week, you have homework in theological terms. Go on a God hunt. Look for, for concrete answers to specific prayers. Look for the leadings of, of promptings from God. Possibly he will come in unexpected resources. Maybe some gifts will come your way. But look for God. And talk about it this week. And ask him to help you see him. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that the word Emmanuel is not just something that we remember at Christmas time, but it's something that can be with us each day. God is with us. And as you have shown that you are with those that we read in your word, we also know that you are with those of us who, who trust you. You never leave us. Help us to look for you this week in unexpected places. Help us to be mindful of the things we say and the things we do. And always to remember that you are with us. So we ask for your blessing this week. That we might have eyes that are open and, and, and hearts that are available to be touched. Always remembering that you are with us. And may you go in the great grace, peace, and presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may you remember that the one who came still comes. And the one who spoke, he still speaks. He is with us. Amen. See you next week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>